Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast and I am Marcus. Have I ever told you who is behind all this and how I managed to introduce you to such a wealth of outstanding personalities from the space sector? No? So let's lift the veil. Behind Space Cafe podcast is Space Watch Global, a growing international network of experts from the space industry. And what's really cool about this network is that it doesn't give a damn where the best stories come from, as long as they are really exciting and really unique. And you know what? The international space world is diversifying at such a rapid pace that everything else would make no sense. No territorial, no national restrictions whatsoever. Because space has no boundaries. And hey, Pakistan has a space program also, and the Scottish do crazy things, and Luxembourg, and so on, and so on. Limits are things of the past, at least in our world. So, what's on the menu today? Certainly one of the happiest and most encouraging episodes in our growing catalog we are proud to present a personality of which there have only been 65 individuals worldwide so far to this day. That is no less than, brace yourselves, 0.0000008.8% of the world's population. Our guest today is required to be extremely healthy and extremely smart for her job. And that's exactly why I put her to the test with a little challenge at the beginning of our show. I asked her to record a backup of our conversation on her smartphone. Well, I got it, but you're going to have to tell me what to do because, um, okay. And all I'm using is the notes app. You don't want me to use like, um, okay, this one does, but I, you know, I don't, you know what? I'm not going to do, I, I know I'm a, I'm a moron. Hang on a second. I'm going to use the, um, The, like the voice recorder one. Uh, where's that? Yeah, you guessed right. Our guest has mastered the little challenge. In the end, a WAF file landed in my inbox. Not bad. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nicole Stott, astronaut extraordinaire. 104 days on the International Space Station, ISS, including extravehicular activity, a woman with an unlikely and uncomparable career. Ready to fly with us? If you need to go to the bathroom, go now. We wait for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 seconds. And off we go. Nicole, let's, let's get down okay. to a little topic here. <laughs> And I really liked the, the way you, re you reacted to me asking you to record everything on your smartphone because you seem to be a little bit unsure about how to do it. And so my question <laughs> is, in superhero <laughs> movies, astronauts are always portrayed as technical super geniuses. But honestly, who takes care of your everyday computer or internet problems at home or when your smartphone does? work at home i think my I, my first go-to is my husband he really enjoys all of that as well and he likes giving me a little bit of grief about how you know makes me want to think that i'm just cursed with the <laughs> electronic <laughs> devices and then my son is really quite good as well okay but i do okay on my own I okay, okay cool it's not my favorite thing though <laughs> but i do okay <laughs> so <laughs> Thanks for, for your honesty. Uh, because yeah. I, I like that because that makes you a human being. And that's good yeah. to hear that Austria, astronauts are still human beings. Yeah. Did I just say Austrians are still human beings? Whatever. Back to astronauts. Yeah, we, yeah, we recognize it in ourselves. Sometimes other people don't see it, but it's true. And I think one of the greatest things like right now about being an astronaut and is that You have to be able to do a little bit of everything. We aren't at a point where we can send, just send the doctor, just send the right. electrician, just send the plumber or the scientist. So you become kind of this jack of all trades person. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great. It's great mm -hmm. because you get to do a little bit of everything. And and then you have, you know, people that'll help you as well. So, yeah. By the way, speaking of COVID, you spent 103 days in space, right? 
So tiny spaces and being close to other people are obviously no problem for you. So did that prepare you for our current COVID situation? I, th I think it did in some ways. You know, I think the, the, the thing that's very different about it is I was choosing to go to that place. I dreamed of doing that, of being in that spaceship and having that experience. I, I haven't met yet anyone who dreamed of what we're going, what we're going <laughs> through right now. So that's where it's very different. But I think in terms of being prepared for it, yeah, I'm happy with it, being in my house with my right. husband and son, having people that I love with me. Also that, you know, my family is relatively close by and I know they're safe and healthy, that I can look out the window and appreciate nature or walk out there. I think that's a big, that's a big deal for me. It was the right. same on the space station. But of course, through that window, you didn't just get to walk out and do go. <laughs> that would have been a bad day. But this, there was something about appreciating nature that way, making that connection to Earth that way. And mm -hmm. I feel like I'm even a little bit more connected because of this and, and appreciating what's around me. And I try to encourage other people to do that as well. Don't get so locked into your place that you kind of miss the awe and wonder that's around you, too. They say one has to leave home to find home, right? I think that's true. Or maybe be stuck home to find, <laughs> to find <laughs> <That's>, home. <absolutely. laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think in that way, it's in the bigger sense. It's in the bigger sense of, I look at this isolation in our own homes. And if you open yourself up to it, you can really, you can really start to appreciate the broader sense of home. I tell people I got back from space. I, I had never meditated before going to space, but I do now because it's like the closest overall experience I can have to that kind of transcendence of looking out the window and seeing Earth, wow. you know, from space. Wow. And so it's like that, throw yourself in a float tank or one of those like isolation tanks and, and meditate. It's even, it even takes it up a notch. But the other thing that all of us can do really in terms of this appreciation of the fact that we live on a planet is to just go outside. It doesn't matter where you are. Go outside, bare feet, the whole earth thing. Let your feet mm -hmm. make contact with the ground. Really appreciate that you're, you know, you're standing on this planet and then look up and know that and be you know, we're protected by this thin blue line of atmosphere and be yeah. in awe. Goosebumps already okay. right now. <laughs> yeah. So, so, Nicole, let me guess, you wanted to be an astronaut since kindergarten, right? No. I, I, that would have been too much you know. cliche, right? <laughs> there are a lot of people like that, though. Yeah. And, but they um, never get to be astronauts. Some of them do. Some of my colleagues actually <laughs> from, like, I was, what, seven when... Um, six and a half, seven for the moon landing in 1969. And I have vivid memory of that experience of my family watching on the black and white TV and then later going out and looking at the moon and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But um, at the time, even though, I mean, nobody told me I couldn't be an astronaut, um, thankfully, but I just remember thinking, wow, that's really cool. You know, I, that's really cool that there's there's people walking on the moon, wow. you know, to look up and, and think about that. But it was a really, really long time before I started to think that this astronaut job wasn't just something only other special people get to do. Mm -hmm. And, and you know a, how things fly. <laughs> that's a very interesting point you just made. Wouldn't you consider yourself extremely exclusively special? No, not at all. I would uh, consider myself extremely um, fortunate, <laughs> mm -hmm. lucky, maybe, definitely blessed and grateful for the experience. But I remember interviewing for the astronaut office, you know, they bring you in, they bring in like a group of 20 people at the same time, you're all there to interview for these very limited positions. And, and I interviewed twice. The first time around, I didn't get selected. And then a couple of years later, I interviewed again and very fortunately did. But in both of those scenarios, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the, the 19 people around me that I'm wow. there with. I'm like, oh my gosh, these people are really smart. Wow. They're doing like super cutting edge stuff. What am I doing here? When it came to science or the thing. I'm like, why? Really? I was like, why would they pick me? And, and that why would they pick me thing? Like almost completely took me out of the running because I almost didn't even pick up the pen and fill out the application because I doubted myself so much that 
it just didn't seem real that they would ever consider me. And it honestly, it took speaking with people that I consider to be mentors and just saying, hey, I'm thinking about this astronaut thing. What do you think? And they didn't go, oh, Nicole, you'd make the greatest astronaut there ever was. Wow. And all that. They, they, they might say let, that. Let now. me let now. me guess. <laughs> let, let me guess. The other <clears throat> the others were usually men who were like, um, let me do the thing. I can do everything. I mean, well, I'll tell you. There, you know, you, you mentioned you have two daughters. I think there's there is. I don't like to stereotype anything. I'll, I'll just say that. You know, my, my one line, which I would say say to your daughters or to other young women, is, "Hey, the rocket ship doesn't care if you're a boy or girl. Right. It doesn't care." You know. So we do these things to ourselves. But young, young women, and maybe even older women like me, we tend to feel like I think that we already have to be like have to satisfy every requirement or exceed them before we ever will even consider picking up the application. Where men in general and even young boys are like, oh, I can do about some of that stuff. I've never done other stuff before, but I, why? They'll pick me. I can do it. I know I could do it. And there's, it's a very different kind of perception of ourselves, Absol I think. Absolutely. It's a, yeah. I think uh, you guys are a lot more humble when it comes to <laughs> appearing on the face of the earth and men just aren't. And this is something I'm experiencing as a science journalist because I'm a filmmaker. And so I'm really very often trying very hard to get female um, scientists in front of my camera, in front of the yeah. microphone. And uh, usually I hear the very cliche answer, I'm not good enough, I'm, I need to prepare more, uh, my colleague is better and whatnot. And this is a serious problem. Yeah. They're all out there. Yeah. I'll tell you, I've been very thankful in the, in the human spaceflight side of things that the numbers still are not in balance, but it's generally been a lot more progressive than a lot of the science areas in general. And, and it, needs to, it needs to change. We need to figure out how do we approach your daughters with these ideas that they are strong young girls that can find their path, what they're curious about, exactly. choose it and exactly. do it. And we got to increase that pool, the, <laughs> the people that are right. out there and available. And yeah. Yeah. So let, let's get back to your, uh, the, the early days of your career. Yeah. It was awesome. So I grew up wanting to know how things fly. My dad built and flew small airplanes. We hung out at the airport. That's where I discovered that, that love of flying and wanting to know how things fly. I, As I was getting ready to graduate from high school, I had no idea really if I was going to go to college or not, but my friends were. So I guess that's what you mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And since I wanted to know how things fly, I spoke to some people and they're like, oh, well, then you need to study aeronautical engineering. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thankfully, okay. Thankfully, nobody told mm -hmm. me how difficult aeronautical mm -hmm. engineering was because I don't know if I would mm -hmm. have chosen it myself then. But I did. Went to a great school where... People loved flying. We were on an airport. It was Embry-Riddle over in Daytona. And then I ended up with a job at um, Pratt & Whitney working on jet engines. And then I got my job that I had applied for at NASA as an engineer at the Kennedy Space Center. And that was like dream come true. I mean, I honestly wow. thought I had made it. I hadn't started thinking about astronaut as a real mm -hmm. possibility Option. at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah, it was about nine into the 10 years of working at Kennedy that started percolating up for me. And I got to work on up close and personal with the space shuttles in every facility, you know, wow. in the hangar where they were at, out on the runway, getting them back to the hangar at the launch pad and the launch control center, everywhere, just really intimately getting to know these vehicles and the people who just honestly passionate believe the care and feeding of those spacecraft were, were their responsibility. Did you... Did you ever secretly try to touch the engines of the space shuttle? How yeah. does that feel? It feels great. And I touched them when I was allowed to touch them. You're <laughs> in the proper equipment and all that. To sit inside it, to walk out to the hangar and look up and have the belly of the orbiter wow. be right mm -hmm. there. It's incredible. And it's funny because I don't, I don't care if you're in a job that you just really love. There's going to be bad days. And I don't know, at Kennedy Space Center, when there was a bad day, You just walked down to the hangar and you stood <laughs> in awe of this machine. And you just readjust. Yeah, yeah. you just like, okay, I, all right, I'm good. And 
So I worked there. I worked in almost every area you could work in on the space shuttle um, program, helping get the vehicles mm. ready to fly. I did some work um, the last few years as we were building up the the hardware for mm-hmm. the space station program and getting ready to launch and fly that equipment. And in that last year or so, um, and maybe I'm slow, but it took me, you know, I started realizing like, hey, you know, getting these vehicles ready for these astronauts to fly mm-hmm. on. I was getting to know the people as well. And I started thinking, you know, like, 99.9% of their job is not flying in space. <laughs> right. It's here on Earth. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you know what? I would you say I had 104 days in space and I was in the astronaut office for 15 mm-hmm. years. So that's, you know, the balance <laughs> is not, <laughs> okay. you know, space improvable. Yeah, yeah. And so um I thought, you know, that okay, that reality check set in. Then I'm like, you know, about at least 80% of what they do is a lot like what I'm doing already as a NASA engineer. Mm. And so that's when I started thinking, ah, maybe I could even just consider this. Mm. And I spoke to people that I, you know, that I consider to be mentors and they encouraged me just to pick up the pen and fill out the application. I mean, the one thing I had total control over, but would have talked myself out of if I hadn't spoken to them. Like no harm done, nothing can happen. Doesn't cost you anything, doesn't Mm -hmm. hurt you, nothing. And you have total control of it. Yeah, so that I try to tell kids that. I'm like, do not, do not take yourself out of the running because of the thing you have control of. (laughs) Even if you're rejected for the first time. Yeah, or every time. Right. I mean, that's what I look at. I mean, I know people. I know people who have applied ten times and wow. never gotten an interview, wow. even. Wow. But they just keep doing it. And as they're doing it, what I love to see, and this is, and some of them should be astronauts because this is part of that kind of grit, is that when you don't get selected, they're still out there. They're doing what they love. They're learning more. They're expanding on what they, and they were already, they were qualified to be an astronaut. You never know. I mean, that's a sad thing. You never know why you don't get picked. You know, I mean, it's. So uh, tell me, so the number of potential applicants narrows down, goes down to five, four, three, two, one. So how did that feel to be the chosen one? It was, I use the word surreal a lot with respect to the astronaut flying in space world. But at that point, that was, it, it was still unbelievable to me. I mean, I remember hanging up the phone after getting the call and thinking, I wonder if that really was Bill Parsons, the person who <laughs> was supposed to be that was calling me. And yeah, you just, I still pinch myself. N- Nicole, let's go back to that moment when you got the call. Where were you? Yeah. I was in Houston already because Mm -hmm. I had interviewed two years before that. And that was when I was working at Kennedy Space Center. I interviewed for the class of 1998. Mm -hmm. It's a long time ago now, isn't it? And I didn't get selected for Mm -hmm. that class, but they offered me a job in Houston flying on the shuttle training aircraft as a Mm -hmm. flight engineer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here it was, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I did get picked to be an astronaut, but they're going to let me fly on NASA airplanes and train astronauts Mm -hmm. how to land the space shuttle. And so I did that for two years. And let me just tell you, if you apply and they don't pick you, but they offer you a job doing something else, you take that job. (laughs) 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 Because what they're doing, there's something they're looking for. So it was one Mm -hmm. of those places where they can check you out. But I got the call. I was at home. I was about to leave to go to the airport to do my check ride Mm -hmm. for my instrument rating, for my pilot instrument rating. And I get this call and honestly, I expected it to be a call to say, hey, sorry, when I figured out who it was Mm -hmm. and it wasn't. And I I just sat there. I, you just, I don't know. You don't even know how to react. Thank you. Yes. You want to stay (laughs) a little bit calm. You don't want to be freaking out and screaming Mm -hmm. on the phone. So after you hang up the phone, then you you do the dance of joy and stuff. Right. Yeah. And it was funny because we were told not to tell Mm. anyone. Of course not. And so I'm like, what do you mean? Don't tell anyone. And I said, I can tell my husband, right? You know, oh, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. But just don't tell, you know, just don't tell anyone. We want to make the announcement Mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, and then I go off to do my check ride, flying in the airplane with the the instructor, the examiner, 
And I had the the grin across mm-hmm. my face. There was this elevated level of joy in the mm-hmm. cockpit kind of mm-hmm. thing. And we got done and he just looked at me and he's like, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I said, I'll have to tell you in a little while, but it's a good okay. thing. You know? Okay. So he knew, I guess. Well, he knew something was up. He yeah, had no idea yeah. what. So um, I think once you were selected, uh, um, you were still pre-tough days when it comes to the actual training, right? So yeah. I guess like astronauts are not born. So what is training <laughs> like? Yeah, when you first get selected, you're not even called an astronaut. Is it like going to school? It's a lot. It is a lot like going to school. Okay. The bulk of it is a lot like going to school. And when you're first selected, you're not called astronaut. You're okay. called astronaut candidate or okay. ASCAN is the, mm-hmm. you know, the short ASCAN. for that. Mm-hmm. And ASCAN, yeah. And, and it is. There's a whole curriculum, you know, of lessons about, you know, like for me, I was going to be flying on the space shuttle and or the Soyuz spacecraft at the time, as well as the space station. And so, you know, you're going back to school to learn all mm. about those systems mm-hmm. and how the spacecraft work and what are the emergencies and how do you stay all, you know, everything about it. And then of course, there's the kind of skills-based training associated with how do you do a spacewalk? Mm -hmm. How do you fly the robotic arm to capture things and move stuff around? How do you do the science on board? All of those kinds of things. And then in parallel with that, you have a job too. You get assigned to one of the technical areas within the program, and that could be helping develop the procedures for working on the science and the payloads or sitting on console in the mission control mm-hmm. center as a Capcom, talking to the folks that are in space, all of that across the board, even things working with some of the future development for, for spacecraft. So all along until you get a, a spaceflight assignment, you're doing a mix of these things. And probably the most difficult one for me was learning to speak Russian. <laughs> and everybody, when I think back, I'm like, what was the most difficult thing about it? Well, it was learning to speak Russian. Because so how much Russian do you need to speak? Speak Russian or just a bunch of lines? You needed to be able to speak and understand Russian. You needed to be able, because at the time, and even now, our, even if you weren't flying to and from the space station on the Soyuz spacecraft, that spacecraft <laughs> was our rescue vehicle. And mm. so all of it is in Russian. The instrument okay. panels are in Russian, the procedures, okay. the control. I mean, you had to be able to function in that sure. environment. Thankfully, <laughs> on board the space station, it's all English is the official okay. language. Mm. So everybody has to be able to speak English too. But yeah, but that was for somebody who was over 40, had never spoken a second language. Wow. Now wow. you're going to learn Russian. I was so thankful that the alphabet is phonetic because mm. I don't know how... <laughs> Wow. <laughs> this survived otherwise. Wow. Yeah. How does that, in, how does, I mean, like, it's kind of strange for an American almost astronaut to, first of all, n- learn Russian and then po- potentially fly on, an, on a Russian spacecraft. So how does that feel for an American? Is that like well, all, totally normal or well, I mean, for like, this American, there's, it was there's like a bunch of, of historic baggage uh, attached to that. There's historic baggage attached probably with every country we're partnered with <laughs> <Right>. on, <laughs> on the space station. But that's part of the beauty of it, isn't mm-hmm. it? When you look at this, the space station program, which this year was 20 years of continuous human presence in space on that masterpiece. And We've got JAXA, you know, the Japanese space agency, the Russian space agency, European, right. you know, our friends in Cologne, where that is based, and Canada, and these five international agencies with 15 countries represented. It just, I don't know, I think it's, the, it, historically, it's going to be the legacy of this okay. program, okay. that this peaceful, successful thing It's, going in fact, on. a peace project. Absolutely. There are quite a few of us who have once again put it in and are trying to support a Nobel Prize for it. But it absolutely is. And I think it it's the best example for how we should be living and working as crewmates here on Spaceship Earth, right? You know, closed loop system. I kind of look at it like, okay, thin metal hull of the space station, thin blue line of atmosphere. On the space station, though, we're every day, we're acutely mm-hmm. aware of how much CO2 mm-hmm. is in our atmosphere, mm-hmm. how much clean drinking water we have, mm-hmm. all of that kind of thing. And we just haven't gotten to that point down here where we realize we need to monitor it Absolutely. and manage it. You know what? 
I was completely blown away when I first heard the analogy between an apple and the earth and its atmosphere. Yeah. And I mean, like the atmosphere being at the size of the peel of an apple. Yeah, like a veil. I mean, like, isn't, is, isn't that incredible? The fragility of this planet. Yeah, it's, it is incredible. And it's kind of like, you know, when we talked about going out, like planting your feet in the grass and feeling that connection mm. to the planet and looking up. I think for the most part, we get this sense that blue goes on forever. That, it's, not, ah, it's just there doing what it's right. supposed to do for me. It'll be there. And no, yeah, it is. Turns it is, black pretty quickly. Yeah, veil thin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Back to training. How was that? Yeah. Did you did you do all the, those crazy centrifuge stuff and <laughs> those cliche things? We do some of that. I would say most of that experience really happens in the little trainer jets that we fly okay. in, the T-38 okay. trainers. There's a lot of extreme flying in that and working as a crew and those aircraft. We do, for the Soyuz training, we do the like full centrifuge runs. Really awesome. They got your picture on, your video on the screen and you're <laughs> doing the thing. And you get up to eight Gs in that, I think. The beauty, though, of pulling Gs in a spacecraft, at mm. least for launch landing kind of profiles, is that it's through your chest. So oh. you're on your back when you launch. Right. It's through your chest, which is much more tolerable than pulling G's yeah. in an airplane where it's coming through your head vertically mm -hmm. and you're having to do all that yeah. stuff. And that doesn't mean mm -hmm. when you've got eight G's going on and it's on your chest that you're not doing a little bit of that, but it is, it's a, a lot better than yeah. doing okay. it, you know, the other way. But okay. that's so much fun. All those things are so much fun, cool. aren't they? Yeah. You don't want to be in the situation that requires it in real life, but... Um, so you learned Russian, you did the crazy yeah. centrifuge stuff, you did a lot of learning. How long did it take until you were ready to go? Well, uh, our ASCAN or our astronaut candidate training was about two years. Okay. And back in 2000, when I was selected, we were told at the time it would probably be four to six years before getting our first flight assignment, just because of the manifest, how many flights we had, all that kind of thing. And then sadly, in 2003, we had the Columbia accident, mm -hmm. space shuttle accident. So that slowed us down to where everyone in my class and the class after after mine, or even the one before, mm -hmm. it was more like eight to 10 years okay. wow. before your first flight. Though well before that, two mm -hmm. years into it, we were all qualified to get a mm -hmm. flight assignment. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, it's worth the wait. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's worth the wait. <laughs> so... Are we, are we ready to talk about launch date? How does that feel? I cannot even imagine how that, that must feel. Do you sleep before that? How many nights do you not sleep before that? Or are you so cool <laughs> as a well, human being that you just do not care about it all? No, I don't think there's, if you don't care, there's something mm -hmm. wrong. You just don't okay. understand the situation. Okay. But I think that you're so ready You're anxious for what it's going to feel like. You okay. want to do it. You've trained for so many years mm -hmm. with most of that training being about all the stuff that can go wrong and how you're going to work as a crew to manage that and stuff that you just want to feel it for real. You want to get to space and start doing that work that was important. And yeah, but today, actually today is the 11th anniversary of my first launch attempt back wow. in um, 2009. So it was STS-128, uh, the, the flight of discovery that was going to take me to the station and then drop me off for three months. And we were out at the launch pad. It was middle of the night. I think it was like a four o'clock in the morning kind of thing. And we, we scrubbed. I just posted a picture on Instagram that this photographer took, Ben Cooper, that is just fantastic. Mm. It's like the lights all shining out at the pad uh -huh. at night. And then this big bolt of lightning, like vertical right next to us. <laughs> so we didn't go that night. We went a few okay. nights later. But so do you actually get to go back home in, in, uh, in between? No, we're in quarantine then. So we're living on at the Kennedy Space Center in our quarantine facilities. Sure. Only, the quarantine, you know, that is not to get sick, right? Yeah, okay. it's, it's the primary reason with it, for us to not just take something to space with us okay. that could ruin our mission, but could also, you know, hurt the other people that are there as well. But so. you mentioned you have a 13-year-old son. So uh, if I do my math right, he must have been two years old back then. Okay. He's 18. He's so, 18, yeah, okay. I mean, I'm so he's 18 years old. And so he was seven when I So he was seven. Time. So um, how 
did you say goodbye? And what did you tell him where you were going? Yeah, I, I can't he... even imagine that situation. I know. I know. That's the hardest part about it all. People ask, was I afraid? All that. I wasn't afraid for the launch. Mm. I wasn't afraid for what life would, you know, the risks in space. I, I wasn't afraid of that. I was respectful of that. Totally. I was afraid of something happened to my son on wow. the earth where I couldn't wow, be there. I was afraid of how he was going to feel watching me go do this. But my husband and I tried very hard through the years of training and leading up mm. to it as he was growing up for him to know what I was doing, for him to know oh, the people I was right. working with, the work I was doing. And so he'd feel like he was part of the crew, actually. Oh. Yeah. So then at yeah. some point you said goodbye to your husband. So yeah. goodbye, hon. I'll be back in a couple of days. See ya. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> couple months yeah <laughs> all right let's move on and let's go to the actual launch day yeah tell us a little bit about that well yeah so there's i mean there's a lot of tradition associated with you know launching to space and stuff and kind of the timeline of getting up and having breakfast or whatever meal it is you want to have before you fly in space and Going into kind of that, that iconic room where you're in the, the Barca lounger getting all suited up into the orange suit and walking out to the vehicle to go to the pad. And so you had your favorite oatmeal? I think I had, I think I had a sandwich okay. and stuff. It was when we launched, when we finally launched, it was like a minute before okay. midnight okay. that we launched. So it felt, right. I don't know, still sandwich like time. Have some other kind of food. Yeah. And yeah, so you get out to the launch pad and. Every time you get out there, you do, you just as a, you want to like, just be in awe mm. again of this vehicle that's mm -hmm. going to take you to space. And when you stand at the base of the launch pad, the, it's really like the first time you're out there where the vehicle is running. Mm -hmm. It's, it really seems like it's alive, wow. like a big mm -hmm. dragon mm -hmm. kind of huffing or something. And so you want to get a good look at that and think about it taking you safely to space mm -hmm. and then you get all strapped in and you're strapped in a couple hours before launch and everybody gets comfortable and the crew really does, didn't have any active role until about 20 minutes mm -hmm. before launch. I remember all of us getting in our, you're on your back mm -hmm. in your seat, get all comfy and get your stuff situated and then just napping mm. for a little of while. <laughs> What else would you do? So the little nappy nap there sure. and then, and then getting back engaged and monitoring and making the calls you need to make as, but I'll tell you, it's not until that 10, nine, eight phase mm -hmm. of the countdown where you really start to think this might happen. You're in disbelief, right. I think, mm -hmm. even though, you know, it's you're too in this big. real, it's too big, too special, it's like, this isn't happening. Yeah. How could I possibly get to do this? And yeah, it's not until that 10, nine, eight thing where you're like, okay, we might, <laughs> we might be going today. <laughs> and the space shuttle was cool because at six seconds is where the, you know, it had a big orange tank and that was just liquid hydrogen and oxygen that fed the three little engines on the back of the orbiter. And so that's when those lit. And I always remember thinking, man, that's got to be like really loud and really shaky and stuff. And it wasn't, I mean, it was kind of a rumble. Mm -hmm. And the whole vehicle did what the NASA technical term, this twang maneuver, like the tip of it rotated 10 feet. And then right when it was back vertical was when you hit zero. And that's when those big solid rocket boosters lit. And that's when you knew you were leaving the launch wow. pad. It was almost like, was I ever on a launch yeah, pad? Because yeah. you felt like you're wow. kicked from behind and shaken like I never imagined I could shake like jello inside kind of shaken and then you feel the three of you climbing on top of you because you're going to pull three G's as you're doing it and I just remember no control over like the smile that comes on mm -hmm. the face and the high five for the person mm -hmm. next to you and the little woohoo <laughs> coming out of here didn't want to be unprofessional about it sure. you know but you had to you had to let that out and just the human like the human reaction to it to that power. I mean, 7 million pounds of thrust, like shoving you off the ground into space. And then eight and a half minutes later, being in orbit, this peaceful, liberating, like free, if it's not tied down, it's floating kind of thing. And does it feel yeah, like, to go from I mean, like, you're still tied down, right? Because um, you're floating around only when you're up mm. on the space station. Because I was just wondering, how does it feel? Does it feel like being underwater? Is that comparable or is it still beyond that? So when you first get to space, yeah, you're strapped in mm -hmm. for a while, still about an hour or mm -hmm. so of just getting this, the vehicle configured to make sure it's safe mm -hmm. and all of that before you can get out of your seat and float around. 
And, and it's just amazing that we can do that. We can go from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. That's crazy. But yeah, so you can't wait to get out of your seat to see what it's going to feel like. And it's floating in water is probably the closest I can come to. Um, I'm not like on the surface of water though, but maybe Dead Sea. Yeah. Where you just, you're, it's effortless. You're not having to think at all about floating. Um, that's why I like those float tanks, the isolation tanks because of the temperature as well. But the general feeling of it, I think if you get into a swimming pool or the water where you're not at the top, you're not at the bottom, you're in the middle and you just close your eyes and let your body just take mm -hmm. a natural position, there okay. is to it. Yeah. So um, we're closing in on the space station a couple of hours yeah. later. So being in space, how does that feel do you feel you belong or do not belong to that space yeah i think we do it feels awesome i it really i highly recommend it yeah there's something and there's something about i think human beings there's um we go to these extreme environments you know i got to live underwater for a while you go live in space but wherever we go somehow our brains our bodies figure out how to adapt to it mm -hmm. now we need to have our life sure. support systems sure. and that kind mm -hmm. of thing it's not like you can just go back in the space and mm -hmm. expect to survive mm -hmm. but with the proper life support, it's really interesting mm. to me how we can adapt, adapt to, just mm, kind of naturally mm. adapt to it. And it, where it becomes natural feeling. Like when I went back, it felt like I'd never left. Mm, I mean, it felt like I was just, oh, I'm, wow. I'm back in space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this wow. is cool. And, back home again. And that was a good feeling. But yeah, I think we're supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. There's the second home. And I think, yeah, I think we're we're curious. We're meant to explore it. We're meant to use it in a way that helps us figure out why this place is so special too. You know, I mean, I really believe that, you know, all the work we're doing on the space station, all the work we're going to do when we go back and settle the moon, when we go on to Mars, ultimately it's about improving life on earth. Yeah. I think we have a place there. Is there a doorbell on the space station? <laughs> There's not a doorbell, but we do. We're communicating with each other and you can bang on the hatch, you know, and people can hear, you can hear through that. But there is a bell that the crew members on the station will ring, though, as you're arriving or departing. It's a, I, I guess it's a Navy tradition on ships. So then the hatch opens. How did that feel? Really cool. Because, you know, you're in the space shuttle in comparison to the Soyuz or the mm -hmm. capsules is really quite mm -hmm. spacious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seven people can float around mm -hmm. pretty comfortably. But I'll tell you, when the hatch opens into the space station, which I, the space station is mm -hmm. ginormous. The, vo the interior volume is really quite large, voluminous. Mm -hmm. And and so it almost feels like, wow, it's kind of like going from the inside of your car to the Grand wow. Canyon or something, where it just opens up around you. And you have to think again about how you're going to move mm -hmm. and get from one place to the other and did you, um, not be have, clumsy, you know. Did you know the people aboard the space station from before or was it like, hey, I'm Nicole, nice to meet you? <laughs> no, we knew each other. It's a relatively small community mm -hmm. anyway, but even internationally. But we, we all knew each other. We had all mm -hmm. trained okay. together. In fact, for, for that first space station flight, the training like timeline. It was about three okay. years. And so okay. over that three years, I spent over 50% of my time out of the okay. country, okay. either in Cologne, Germany, in mm. Star City, Russia, Canada, Japan, just back and forth okay. over that three-year period. With, with so no group. need to introduce yourself up there. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's nice to say hi in space though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, probably one of the most exciting parts of your stay on the on the space station was your EVA, your extra vehicular activity, right? That is, it's actually, it's a very special experience. It's another one where you can use the word surreal very appropriately. <laughs> so did you, cool. did you deliberately want to do it or was the possibility to opt out because uh, you weren't feeling like it or could that be done by another person? <laughs> I was trained for that particular spacewalk. I suppose if I had gotten to space and was incapacitated for some reason or really sick or something that I wouldn't have had to do it, but I, yeah, I definitely wanted to do it. I trained to do it. I looked forward to it. 
It was, I mean, you go out, you're like in your own personal spaceship. Wow. It's your own. It, but it's tethered, right? Oh, absolutely. We are tethered all the time. And that's, you are like, okay, I'm stopped. <laughs> yep, another tether. You've got a, what we call a safety mm. tether that's on all the time that runs back to the airlock or like 80 feet to structure. And then whenever you get to a work site where you're going to be staying, you put another local like okay. four foot tether okay. on. And yeah, so... And believe me, you're, that's, you know, you're thinking, okay, yeah, it makes sense. Put on. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be the one that separates from the station and has to use a little jet pack or whatever. You don't want to be that person. And would it be possible, like if the worst thing happened, would it be possible to use the jet pack to get back to where you wanted to go? Yeah, that's what we train for that too. We train for that in a, a virtual reality lab. We have something that can toss you off the station and you're spinning and you get under control and then you find your way back to at least grab some structure on the station to get there. And that's the thing about the space station. When we used to do spacewalks off the space shuttle, when it was just an independent mission, if you got separated from the shuttle, the shuttle could fly to get you. The whole station is not flying to get you, you know? So um, it's a little bit different scenario. And so, but still you don't want to, You don't want to separate from from your spacecraft. Um, but but the spacewalk was interesting. It was like six and a half hours. And during part of that time, um, I got to ride on the end of the big robotic mm -hmm. arm, the like big white crane looking thing. And um, for about 25 minutes, um, pulled this big box mm -hmm. off the end of the station. It was like, a, it actually was a European space agency payload or science experiment. And it was a big box. And on the ground, it would have weighed like 900 pounds. But up there, I was just holding it, could have done anything I wanted with it. And I'm strapped into the end of the arm. So pulled that off. And then they flew me, my crewmate, Kevin, flew me all the way down into the payload bay of the shuttle. And it was one of the neatest experiences because I had assumed that I'd feel like I was moving mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. end of the arm, that I'd feel it jerking mm -hmm. and all that. And I felt like I was standing still on the ground, holding wow. the box The station wow. moved out of my view, earth rotated under me in my view, and then out of nowhere, here's wow. this payload bay of the space shuttle. It was the most wow. surreal thing. <laughs> and it was quiet, and the temperature mm -hmm. was comfortable, and I remember thinking at one point, no, oh, don't fall asleep, don't wow. be one that like, falls asleep on the end of the arm. It was just so peaceful. Wow. You mentioned 104 days in space. Does it ever get boring? It never, I can't imagine it getting mm -hmm. boring. I actually felt a little gypped not to have more time, like a little ripped off not to have more time. The normal missions now are like four to six months on board. It was never boring. And you're really busy. There's a lot going on work-wise. But then the view out the window, I mean, I, I never tired of like feeling like of floating, of flying, and of that view out the window. It just surprises you wow. every time. But even if you're flying over the same place, you're like learning the geography sure. of the planet. You're looking at it. You're recognizing, oh my gosh, I live on a planet. How cool is wow. that? <laughs> I mean, you really get that reality check. Clearly. Do you ever get like private time, your own time where you can sit in that window and read a book? And um, do, you do you have that time? Yeah. You could. Yeah. I mean, you're th throughout the workday. I mean, the day itself is very sure. busy, but we have at the end of the day, like pre-sleep mm -hmm. time where you're getting dinner, where you're hanging out. And then on the weekends, unless there was a special activity or like a spacewalk mm -hmm. or something going on, you, you had uh, more free time on the weekends. There wasn't a lot of free time, but yeah, there were times where I would find, I would be in front of the window by myself. Wow looking wow. at. I have a memory of doing that and early on in the mission and it was before bed and I, I don't know why my crewmates weren't there with me, but they weren't and I'm looking out the window and it's a night pass on the ground. So we circle the earth every 90 mm -hmm. minutes. So about every mm -hmm. 45 minutes or so there's a sunrise mm -hmm. or sunset out the window and this happened to be nighttime on earth and I'm looking and it's gorgeous and, and then all of a sudden this streak of light goes mm -hmm. like by me, between, below me, between me and the earth. I'm like, oh my gosh, what was that? So I fly down to the other end of the station and I ask my crewmate, Mike, I'm like, dude, what was that? You mm -hmm. know, I just saw this light. Oh yeah, shooting star. Wow. I'm like, 
Well, it'd be wow. nice if someone would tell you you're going to see something like that, you know? So I flew back, of course, you know, to the window wanting to see another one, you know, just like we do here. We see one of those. We get lucky wow. enough to see one of those looking up at night, and then you just want to see another mm-hmm. one. And I didn't. And I, I just remember floating there thinking, wow, every day there was something surprising and new. And for something like that, you're so programmed to look up Mm -hmm. at, to be looking up out at the night sky to see, and then to see that below you was just incredible to me. And I remember thinking how beautiful it was. And then I also remember thinking, yeah, yeah, I'm really glad I saw that because that means it didn't hit my space station and there's not a big hole in it. I don't have to worry about it. (laughs) Wow. So did you ever think about those guys who flew way past the ISS if it had existed back then and went to the moon and walked around on the moon? I mean, like, considering yeah. the vastness of that feat. Did you ever get to yeah. think about that while being on the ISS? A, a yeah. lot, actually, a lot. And I remember initially thinking about it because of before flying mm-hmm. in space, having read or heard some of those guys speak about kind of the perception of Earth, mm-hmm. the perspective from space of seeing mm-hmm. Earth like that and uh, uh, using words like insignificant, like, When I really mean, I think they meant like it's small in the grand scheme of things. And in actuality, they were in awe and humbled by it too. But yeah, you know, you think about that. What were we? We're like 250 miles above the planet in low Earth orbit when we're on the space station. They traveled 250,000 miles (laughs) to get to the moon, you know, and then to not just circle the moon or, but with completely different technology. Yeah, totally D- different technology. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we get grief about how old and you know archaic the technology on the space shuttle was. I mean, think about those Apollo mm-hmm. spacecraft. It's it's incredible. So, you know, as human beings, it's something I show kids all the time. It's from one of the mentors that um, encouraged me to pick up the pen. Is this whole this little philosophy of <laughs> here's how we can, not why right. we can't. And by one of my very first bosses at Kennedy, Jay Honeycutt, who was part of that Apollo team that helped get those guys to and from space. And and what he told us was, you know, our job is to solve really incredibly challenging problems. And the way we do that is that we go into it with the idea that there is a solution. Right. Here's how we can do it. And I mean, you know, I've, I've floated in front of the window on the space station many times thinking because you can look Mm -hmm. out into the Mm -hmm. vastness of space too not just back at earth and just it looked like this blackness that went on forever i mean where is the moon (laughs) you know i mean so so amazing yeah i i hope you know maybe when your daughters go to the moon (laughs) (laughs) there's a new generation of spacefarers these days so i i was wondering i i imagine that you watched the first crew dragon mission So Mm -hmm. what do you make of that, especially when it comes to the fancy inside of the dragon with the touchscreens and everything? (laughs) So so because you've seen the other side as well. So what do you make of that? It's just like when I get in a new airplane, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this glass (laughs) cockpit thing. I think the the Apollo guys probably felt the same thing about the space shuttle. Oh, my gosh, look at this. Yeah, if we had stuck with what we already had and not done something different, something perhaps better than I would worry about what we're right. doing as we move forward with the new spacecraft. I'm really excited to just see this continue right. to develop and grow and um, give more people access to space as well. I have the impression that you and the generation before you, you guys were still the pioneers, but now I think we are slowly but gradually moving into a more everyday spacefaring society where it becomes like normal the new normal what do you think yeah i hope it i hope it becomes that way i think we're still i think we're like approaching that perhaps the the two guys that flew on that crew dragon were in my class bob and doug so in the same astronaut class chosen back in 2000 And, you know, something particularly cool about them is that both of their wives are astronauts as well in our class, Megan and Karen. Megan actually will be flying on like the second operational crew dragon, like after the first of the year. And so um, 
you know, for me, for our families watching that, it felt like we were watching family again. Here's our class leading the way was good. But yeah, it's really, it's exciting to see this happen. It's also exciting and necessary for us to really evaluate how we did and make sure that when we do it again, it's, you know, going to be safe for the next crew too. So do you think it's, um, we're in a situation now where it becomes increasingly normal to do space flights like the ones you did, or are we already approaching a phase where we are leaving Earth, some of us leaving Earth for good? I think we're going to get there sooner than to that leaving Earth <laughs> for good thing. In one sense, the, the missions that we're talking about for Mars might require that, might at a minimum, it's three years just to be able to sink the planets up to get there and back. But I think we're getting to the point where we're going to be leaving Earth in a longer, with longer stays. I'm really excited about the fact that we're going back to the moon and that we're going back with the idea that we are establishing mm -hmm. a permanent right. presence there, that it might make it You know, I, I hold hope that by before I'm 80, I could maybe mm -hmm. do that <laughs> in one way or the other, get mm -hmm. there and, and experience that. But I do think there will be more opportunities for more and more people to have, you know, access to space. You know, it's like flying. Right. It was a long time before it became just pretty much anybody able to do it. But Nicole, um, we're slowly but gradually coming to the end of our show. Um, one last question. Um, if I may, I have the impression that science in general could use a little more appreciation in our societies, especially perhaps in the country that you're in. What do you think should we do about that? Um, I think that's true. I think, sadly, it's not just where I'm at, though. I think it's, yeah, I think we're at a point where we... We need to find new ways to communicate the science. And that is going to involve all of us using our whole brains to do that. We've got to engage people who wouldn't. I think about it like, you know, one of my, my like personal missions after flying in space is that I want everyone to know that there is a space station with 15 partner countries working together peacefully, successfully in space for the last 20 years. People should know that. And a lot of people don't. And they don't realize that we're not, we're just throwing money at space. Everything that's spent on space is spent down here. And everything that's done there is about improving life on Earth. Um, and that's the science of it, is everything about that's done about the science there is about improving life on Earth. But we've got to find ways to engage people where they make a connection, a relationship to it that um, is perhaps different than the way we've been doing that so far. What's your message to the younger generations? I think, first of all, I would ask them to, to pay attention to what they enjoy and figure out how that, how they can explore that to benefiting life around them. I want my son, I want all of the younger people to realize that they are the crew members here on Spaceship Earth. I want to them to accept that responsibility to not just be passengers. For them to know, hey, I live on a planet. There's that thin blue line that protects me and only border that matters um, is that thin blue line of atmosphere. And we're all Earthlings. You know, we got to get it together. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons why you why you gravitated towards um, creating art triggered by your experiences in space. So we didn't get to talk about that, but I think it would make sense if we told our audience um, where they could take a look at those beautiful paintings. Do you have, do you have it up on a website? I have, yeah. So two places where they can go. Um, for my for my own artwork, it would be, you know, nicolestott.com. And, and then where I would really encourage them to go is to uh, find out a little bit more about the Space for Art Foundation, which is where we're bringing kids together from all over the planet with their artwork and pulling it together into beautiful suits like this. And that would be spaceforartfoundation.org. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nicole. My pleasure. What a privilege to talk to an extraordinary person like you. <laughs> I, I hope uh, you guys out there feel the same way. The world is a good place and it needs more such voices to remind us of just that. And let's fill the world with such voices, I would say, to make such a noise that the usual bullies 
are no longer heard. How about that? Are you with me? Yeah. Apart from that, all that remains is for me to thank you again for your time, Nicole, and your time, dear listeners, wherever you are at the moment. Take care and see you next time. Thank you. 